This is essentially Aliens the board game, or Alien the board game, whichever one you so desire. It doesn't say that, but when you see the models and the figures and you're going through, you, you, that's what it is. There's a point in our culture, and I mean any culture, not just American, where an individual's creation enters the zeitgeist. It becomes adopted by the masses and appropriated into the landscape. It turns into myth. This is a review of Nemesis, and when I get to discussing the mechanics of the game, I'll be focusing almost exclusively on its cooperative and campaign modes, given that nearly every other review has centered on the default and personally unappealing semi-co-op variant. As such, partway through this video, I will be offering a spoiler warning regarding a few minor points occurring early in the campaign. And by now you're probably thinking, wait, what does all this have to do with Lord of the Rings? Well, I'm glad you asked. The Lord of the Rings, written by J.R.R. Tolkien, became a watershed moment in popular culture, introducing elements into the fantasy genre that would later be usurped by later writers, most notably Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax, who incorporated the mythos into early prototypes of their burgeoning fantasy role-playing game, which would later become Dungeons and Dragons. And I would argue that singular franchise contributed more to the embracing of the Tolkien mythos into modern culture than the books themselves, establishing a precedent that transformative art inspired by other works could stand on their own without fear or repercussion. The establishment of tall elves, short halflings, and stocky dwarves as canon within a fantasy setting became so ubiquitous we don't stop to think of its origins. It stands as no doubt that the current landscape of popular fantasy connects many of its branches towards the roots of a single title. In 1978, Ridley Scott directed a seminal science fiction film based on a story written by a heavy metal alumni and realized by a group of recently unemployed artists poached from a failed adaptation of the film Dune. Despite the efforts to credit the whole of the film's success upon Ridley Scott, much of the foundation of the film's core was due to the creativity of artists such as Dan O'Bannon, Chris Foss, and H.R. Giger, all brought in after Alejandro Jodorowsky's film collapsed. Alien would not exist if it were not for the failure of Jodorowsky's Dune. The original story was heavily inspired by an earlier science fiction film, Planet of the Vampires, which was grafted onto Cronenberg's horror classic Shivers. Planet of the Vampires had humans following a distress beacon to an uncharted planet, discover a crashed alien spaceship, and inadvertently release a force that can only survive by utilizing a host to extend its own life cycle. All elements that would later find themselves in Alien. The look of technology in Alien was realized by Ron Cobb, a visionary genius that had previously worked on a film shockingly similar released five years earlier, Dark Star. H.R. Giger's reputation by design had already been established. Although considered innovative to the broad public, it was not wholly distinctive, with Giger admitting inspiration from Dado, Ernst Fuchs, and Salvador Dali, and the surrealist Z Z Z Z Z Z Z that guy, producing superficially related works during the same time period. There could be an argument that if Ridley Scott had not made his film when he did, someone somewhere would have. Admittedly, many films made later were produced directly with the intent of imitating the established blockbuster, just as Star Wars had spawned Battle Beyond the Stars, The Last Starfighter, and Battlestar Galactica. Except we no longer look at the last two as being rip-offs of Star Wars. There was a point where we permitted films that touched on the same genre to enjoy their own success without constant accusations of infringement. We build foundations upon foundations, and we need to accept that perhaps no one owns an entire genre. In 1986, James Cameron, secretly desiring to make a film based off Starship Troopers, took the opportunity to make it with Aliens, spearheading a new genre off the heels of the old one. Not only did dark science fiction films set in space have to face accusations of ripping off Alien, now they had to contend with ripping off its successful sequel as well. This proved a disservice to the genre as a whole, denouncing legitimate attempts at originality in an established sub-genre. Event Horizon was accused of being an alien ripoff, despite the only common qualities being that it was set in space and was populated by characters that are killed off in a systematic order. Yet we don't go after every slasher film being a ripoff of Psycho. We dub other subgenres, like slasher, steampunk, but films like Alien, Event Horizon, and the underappreciated Pandorum lack a specific genre title. Space is terrifying. 
H.P. Lovecraft took the very concept of its emptiness as a means to drive people insane. To look into the eye of the cosmos, to see the void, to comprehend the terrors hiding within its depths would certainly be frightening. Every uncharted planet, every derelict spaceship holds infinite potential for fear. I love this genre, even the awful examples of it. Forbidden World, with ripped off effects from Battle Beyond the Stars, Galaxy of Terror, which employed James Cameron as a second unit director, Creature, which starred German psychopath Klaus Kinski, Event Horizon, the only good film by Paul Anderson, Sunshine, the best film by Danny Boyle, and Pitch Black, the first Riddick film. Outside of film, the Tyranids of Warhammer 40k have been accused of ripping off Alien. And let's be honest, those early Hormogons did look somewhat familiar, especially if you swap out their arms with that of a gene stealer's, then stick some wires in their back and paint the whole thing black. I mean, I've heard. With video games, there was Dead Space, one of the best survival horror games ever produced. They claim inspiration, but we don't always vilify them with ripping off Alien. Such brings us to Nemesis, produced by Awaken Realms. Although detailing the mechanics of the game is part and parcel of a video such as this, I will start with a the theme. Dominant. So much so that I firmly believe, unlike other games, said theme was established first before a single rule was written. The basic concept is that players assume the role of crew members of an infamous vessel named affectionately after the Greek goddess of retribution, who awakened from cryogenic suspension to discover the ship overrun by hostile alien life forms. Not only must they fight off this menace, but each crew member must also complete their own bizarrely contradicting personal objective that, strangely enough, does not reach execution until the very last few moments of the mission. Obviously, a ripoff of Alien. Except we saw those hibernation tubes in Forbidden Planet in 1954. Characters all being selfish with their own motivations. Well, outside of Ash, Alien lacks that plot. Characters are required to check the vessel's course, the condition of the engines, none of which are part of Alien. From the onset, I was open to defending the setting and story of Nemesis. I wasn't going to dismiss it as a blatant ripoff, especially considering my adoration for the genre. I backed the campaign based exclusively on its setting. That being said, I hate semi-co-op games. Tom is right. There is really no such thing. In Nemesis, players gain both global and individual goals, the latter often directly involving the death of another player. Yes, this game not only features player versus player, but also boasts player elimination, the latter receiving a certifiable flunking grade from me in regards to game mechanics. The first player eliminated assumes control of the alien menace, and this is not the first time I encountered a rule such as this, a band-aid in my opinion, to cover up a flaw in game design, which is why I'm not reviewing the semi-cooperative game at all. The default cooperative game involves the ignoring of these private objectives in exchange of unique global goals each crew draws but the entire group must complete, an interesting but negligible modification leading me to assume that Nemesis lends itself perfectly to a co cooperative experience on its own. Except it doesn't. Before we dive into why, we need to explain the core mechanics of the game, starting with the action deck. In theory, a brilliant concept. Each player draws up to five cards at the beginning of a round, in a nod similar to games like Terraforming Mars and recently Wingspan. A single round involves players taking turns until incapable or unwilling to do so. Each player takes up the two actions, and if two actions cannot be carried out, or if the players are unwilling to commit to both, that player must pass, ending their involvement this round. Each of these actions costs a number of cards from one's hand. Consequently then, a player would take between zero and five actions in a round. Each player board lists possible default actions along with the actions available via the drawn cards. One rule I got wrong early assumed the card cost equaled the action cost, but this is incorrect. A player can spend any number of cards to commit an action, but can do at most two actions before shifting to the next player. Playing a card may have a zero cost, the only cost being the playing of said card. This is one action. Another card may involve the discarding of two cards, resulting in three. The play card plus two additional. This is still one action. Each of these default action costs one card, these two. Only when a hand is empty is a player compelled to finally pass, ending that character's involvement in a round. A player may also opt to pass early and retain in-hand cards necessary because of forward thinking or of being cautious as the number of cards still in hand at the end of a round aids in defense of that character if an alien attacks. Player boards, despite differing in art, are otherwise identical. The same rules and layout. A character's distinction lies with the character deck and equipment. Of these cards, there are common elements. Rest, search, 
demolition, interruption, basic repairs are all standard cards found in every deck. The rest are unique, but even with these, it still feels like the characters, despite appearances, are a bit too similar. If the soldier lacks any of his only three specific combat specific cards in hand, he is no better a shot than the paraplegic scientist. Much of the skill in inflicting damage is actually dictated by the weapon in hand and the creature being attacked, not the character itself. There can be some thematic reasoning behind this decision, but it still didn't eliminate these moments from the campaign where everyone was waiting on the wheelchair-bound scientist to save the day given his superior firepower. But whatever. Vries was my favorite character in Alien Resurrection anyway. Like the semi-co-op, in full co-op characters are awoken in the hibernation bay, called the Hibernatorium, for some reason, one of five rooms which have their locations fixed. The rest are scattered across the ship, because apparently you didn't tour the ship before going into cryosleep. The game employs a common trope seen in films like these, though ironically not an alien, where cryosleep affects memory, harkening back to Pandorum and humorously enough, Red Dwarf. As a result, a mix of level 1 and level 2 hex tiles are scattered about the ship face down, most of which are vital to the success of a mission, including their generator, the laboratory, the surgery, and the hive. Then place these exploration tokens, which denote how many items can be found in said room, as well as its condition. Shuffle the coordinate cards and place one randomly in the cockpit. Shuffle the engine tiles and without looking, place them in each space, unaware if an engine is working or not. A status revealed, when revealing the top tile. Set up a number of escape pods based on player count, often one less than the number of starting players, not foreboding at all. Set up the intruder board with five egg tokens and three random weakness cards, also face down. Then set up the intruder bag, place one blank, four larva, one creeper, three adult, and one queen. Shuffle all the other cards, event, intruder, attack, contamination, serious wounds, and each of the four equipment decks. Players can then set up their individual areas, with their starting equipment, ammo, and their action decks. There are also two quest items that can be unlocked in-game, as well as the two objectives, one corporate and one personal, a very selective memory loss. Returning to the game, a round begins with players drawing back up to five cards, reshuffling the discard pile if necessary. One item I do like, which some games seem to disagree with, is that players always act first in a round. After each player has passed, the event phase begins. Advance the time track. Intruders attack, characters if on a board, fire spreads, and then one player draws and resolves one event card. The event will dictate which intruders will act, if any, and which direction they will move, referencing numbers on each of the corridors. The event listed on the card is then carried out. A player then draws a token from the intruder bag. If larva, replace it with an adult. Same with the creeper. With the breeder and an adult, all players roll for noise and return it to the bag. A queen causes that model to appear if there's a character in the hive. Characters spend the majority of their time running or sneaking into rooms, exploring and shooting various weapons, as well as repairing the apparently Fabergé egg-like vessel around them. This is a ship that, if characters stand and do nothing, will eventually spontaneously just explode. If characters move, they must roll for noise, adding a token in a random path. If a token is already present, draw a token from the intruder bag and deal with the threat that appears. And... <sighs> crap. One second... Technically, I should be uh, just uh, spray painting a coat of thin coat of black on this to start. But, and it wasn't until Aliens that Stan Winston uh, and James Cameron, because uh, I think it was actually a bit of both of them, decided to add blue. No, people are going to say I should have painted the bases first, but black washing time, which. I mean, at least some people really hate black washing more than organic. We think black washing is just for tanks and airplanes.
You can opt to spend two cards with stealth. You still place a noise token, but you can decide where it goes. Thankfully, if an encounter does occur, at least all the adjacent noise tokens are removed. Each room has its own action, some requiring power. If malfunctioning, denoted by this broken gear, it must be repaired before it can be used. If a character searches, pick two of the cards from one of the decks indicated by the room and choose one, reducing the number of items in the room by one. You can spend cards to check secretly on the coordinates of the bridge, as well as the condition of the engines. In the default semi-co-op, these are all played out secretly. It would take another 20 minutes to go through all the complex rules of the game, like dealing with corpse tokens and intruder weaknesses, and even though I am apparently obsessed with making ultra-long videos known for their exhaustive thoroughness, even I admit it would get tedious. Let's just say the designers spent a lot of attention making the game as logical as possible, to make sure the theme controls the game mechanics and not the other way around. Until exceptions occur. Bizarre, almost jarring anomalies. I mentioned previously that, by and large, it is the weapon and the enemy that dictates attack success and damage rather than character skill. There's also a bizarre rule where enemy hit points are constantly in flux. Each time an enemy is hit, you draw an intruder attack, indicating its hit points for that attack. It could have 2 when you flex 1, then to 5 when you flex 3, then back 3, killing the creature. I can understand the reasoning, but no matter the group I played with, they all felt that rule was weird. Additionally, you can activate our room for your own benefit, but there is nothing in place that tells you you can do it for someone else. Like in the emergency room where you can heal your wounds but not someone else's. Or the fact that you have to enter a room to discover it on fire. The most egregious involves a mandatory activation of two actions per turn, rather than one or one or two like terraforming Mars. If you cannot or don't want to commit to two, you must pass for that entire round. It would seem an easy game to adapt to being fully cooperative, so imagine my surprise when the designer spent as little effort as possible making one. In the included fully cooperative mode, each player draws one global objective the group must succeed at. Thankfully, these do not conflict, and players can work together to accomplish these tasks. The co-op also includes a revive ability where a player's corpse token can be taken to the emergency room to be restored. A bizarre exclusion in the default game, and also one shining a glaring beacon to the absence of the rule when a player can use the emergency room on another living character. But that's it. The only modifications to the rule set. Are there problems? Well... I've mentioned the character decks, but didn't go into each thoroughly. One card each player possesses is, is an interruption card that counteracts a rival player's action. This card serves no function in the co-op portion of the game. There are also specific cards in specific decks that are more advantageous in a competitive game, resulting in certain characters being effectively mandatory in any cooperative game. The Soldier, for example, must accompany every session, and I'd wager, given the way our games have run, the mechanic would also be a no-brainer. These are minor quips, as most of the time you are just discarding cards to activate actions anyway, so a few useless ones are expected. The real problem with the co-op game is tedium. With four players and four objectives, Nemesis drags. It really drags, resulting in characters often double-backing and retracing their movement constantly in their efforts to defeat aliens and complete the various objectives. If you need to destroy the hive, you may need to reveal the entire ship to do so. You always need to check the engines no matter what, and if the Queen's death objective is announced, expect a much more difficult mission than previously thought. After completing the game with most, if not all, characters alive, check your Fitbit because chances are your entire evening just passed by. Which brings us finally to this. What's that to me? You never received a graphic novel? Well, that's okay. It's just the best overall feature of the game. Untold Stories is a choose-your-adventure-style graphic novel sewed into the fabric of the game. The art style is... Okay, okay. It, it's an acquired taste. And the narrative is muddled at worst, predictable at best, but at least it offers the illusion of an actual story. And for those interested in diving into such a tale blind, this is your opportunity now to step away. The comic introduces a world where, in the distant future, half the human race is wiped out when an unknown object collides with and destroys our moon. And no, this is not the opening of Oblivion, just in case you were wondering. After recovering strange new compounds and what the comic refers to as multi-dimensional crystals, the remnants of mankind take to the stars. A few pulp culture references later, and the first mission begins not on the nemesis, but on the alternate side of the board, the Ariadne. 
The campaign employs unique tokens such as triggers, stories, and clues, a few obviously borrowed from another game. In this one, a character killed is eliminated. Again. But thankfully there are additional characters to spare that coincidentally show up to fill in the gap. Only when there are no replacement characters can one be resurrected the same as in the regular co-op game. The first mission begins with the crew of the Ariadne being trapped on their own ship, docked at, the, at a distant space station. With their memory expectedly hazy, the characters must repair the engine and escape before their official deaths are technically confirmed. Throughout the game, you commonly refer to panels in the comic, progressing the story, and you quickly begin to love this narrative, allowing you, you to make actual choices that carry consequences later on. Missions are not terribly challenging, but occasionally players must take on additional risk to make later more difficult missions easier. Injuries, equipment, and quest items are persistent through the campaign. The story eventually brings the crew of the Ariadne face to face with the notorious nemesis, creating a slew of new choices and after effects to benefit or suffer from. Until the end of mission 3. Obviously, I won't go into detail on what happens, that's too far in, and I'd prefer everyone to revel in the utter disappointment that occurs at the end of this mission. No doubt, this unavoidable ending is a plot contrivance, a necessary gimmick forced into the game to solve quickly and spitefully the chain of consequences good or bad inherited throughout the three previous games. It disregards any investment had until that moment to create an ending so unpleasant that after a three day marathon running through this four session campaign, my fiance walked away refusing to play the game again for nearly a month. And no, the fourth and final mission does not make up for this. It's a bleeding shame considering how invested we had gotten with these still nameless characters. It would have been way more interesting to create personal arcs to reveal the identities of these blank slates. And to make matters worse, it doesn't fully resolve the story, promising an untold stories volume 2 at some undefined point in the distant future. It should be made clear that Nemesis is a great game, but it's frustratingly imperfect. Miniatures are great, the graphic design unparalleled, but then it gets dragged down by bizarre choices in game design. It's far too random. There is precious little any player can do to mitigate the chance results of anything, whether they be a die roll or a card draw. Game is also frustratingly unbalanced for less than four characters, meaning, especially in the campaign mode, playing four characters is mandatory. There are no ways to employ the environment to kill intruders, there are no, re, uh, no usable melee weapons, with hand-to-hand -hand combat virtually useless if attempted. But with limited ammo, moments can occur where players can feel useless as the maw of the random number generator closes around them. And the tedium of the co-op game could have been solved with a singular objective with variant rules rather than tedious small objectives resulting in busy work. And though I love the comic, it suffers from production quality issues. The fan community, well aware of, this, of the game's issues, have posted homebrew alternatives, ones I employ on occasion. New weapons only have one ammo, I'd replace that with full ammo, same with using the armory. Breeders should draw two cards, but half the highest card as having them as powerful as queens makes no sense. I agree intruders should be powerful, but I've noticed that most characters remain in fight with severe consequences when trying to escape. Dropped items should remain on the board to be picked up by someone else, that seems obvious. At the beginning of a round, the first player can remove one noise token from a room with no characters in it. That one just makes sense. I'd also make a rule where a kill, kill player employing a corpse token could make its way back to the emergency room to get resurrected if no one is willing or able to do it for him or her. These are optionally but thematically consistent. And of course, you should be able to help other characters in rooms if you want. After all that, I'm still interested in continuing with this voyage. I want to get that second graphic novel to see where it all ends, or continues. I still have Wave 2 en route by the posting of this video. No game is perfect. This one gets a 7 out of 10. Nemesis is fun, one of the better games birthed from Kickstarter that I've received. And I'm happy that it is a game first, with miniatures secondary, placing the priority where it belongs. This is Chris from DSX Machina.